From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 71, recorded on August 28, 2023. I'm Cindy Leifer, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. As you may have noticed, I'm not Vincent. (laughs) Our fearless leader isn't able to be here today, but he put his faith in me and the rest of the crew to deliver a great episode for you. So joining me today from Cleveland, Ohio, is Stephanie Langle. Hello. Great to be here. Look at us doing it on our own. Well, I shouldn't say on our own. We do have, (laughs) yeah, it is the girl power episode. Um, but we do have some really great, uh, behind the scenes help. We're very thankful for it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Happy to be here and look forward to chatting. Great. And joining us from Madison, New Jersey is Brian Barker. Hi, great to be here with you guys for a girl power episode. Yeah. Uh excited to, to talk about things. I've been telling people that this was going to happen and they were like, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear it. So not a lot of pressure, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I believe Vincent had, I think, another podcast. It was something. Influenza. Yeah, some conference. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Conference. I don't know. But yeah. we wish him well. Yeah, we wish him well. And we were going around and, and emails. Then, you know, we we take turns every every month to who's going to present and Brianne's turn, I think, to present, and you were yes. able to uh, pick the paper, and it's I'm I'm very excited. It touches on some themes that we've done in the past. Yes, yeah, um, this paper was sent to me, um, and I was really interested in reading about it, and I thought it would be a nice fit for Immune, both because on our previous episode, episode seventy, we talked a little bit about um, type two. Um, mm-hmm. immunity mm-hmm. Um, when we were talking about food allergy avoidance. Yep. Yep. And this also really made me think a lot about um, our previous episode with Kiki Fairfax. Mm-hmm. Um, she works on immune responses to helminths. And in fact, mm-hmm. she made a point at one point about how we evolved with them. And in some ways, you know, our immune system may be used to seeing them. That may be a, a standard state. <laughs> Right. The amount of time that we have not had concurrent or recurrent helminth infections is much shorter than the amount of time that we would have been dealing with them over the course of evolution. Exactly. So the paper is called Exposure to Lung Migrating Helminth Protects Against Murine SARS-CoV-2 Infection Through Macrophage-Dependent T-Cell Activation. I think this hits all of the highlights, right? I love the yeah, macrophages. Exactly. SARS-CoV-2 has been on everybody's mind, and now we introduce the helminths, which is so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, there are two co-first authors, um, Oyabola Oyasola yep. um, and Carrie Hilligan, and then um, two corresponding authors, Alan Sher and Pning Lok. Pung. Pung, Pung Lok. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cindy, all you have from NIH connections with these authors or had well, cross so yeah. And- so I was so excited when you sent this paper because I looked at the first author and I said, man, that looks really familiar. And I Google her and it's Bola. So Bola did her PhD here at Cornell. And oh, so oh, cool. if she listens to this, shout out to you, Bola. Um, yeah, it, it was really fun to see her. So she was doing her PhD with Alea Tewanyo, who, who, actually moved from here to Washington and Bola went with her and I think finished her degree there. But it was really nice to see where Bola's going um, and see that she's down with Pung, um, who moved from NIH or uh, from NYU down to NIH a few years ago. Okay. Very cool. It's a small world, you know? It is a small world. It It gets smaller (laughs) the older you get. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, I also was really interested in this paper because it reminded me of a conversation I had in 2020. Um, So pretty early in spring 2020, during uh, everything going on with COVID, I got an email from a friend who is working at a university in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And he sent me an email and he said, hey, you know, what's what's going on with this thing, this virus? Um, And it seems to not be so serious here. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And of course, this was, you know, something like April 2020 or (laughs) something like that. And I I wrote back something like, I don't know, great question. Maybe it's maybe you're not detecting infections or maybe it's surveillance. And I got a response back. No, it's real. That was (laughs) I was like, okay, I I, I don't know. Um, And 
in August of 2020, Science published this really interesting news article about low fatality rates um, in some parts of the world due to Mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2 and hypothesizing on a few different reasons why um, that might be. Uh, And they mentioned surveillance, but they also mentioned things like, well, maybe age structure if a country Mm -hmm. has fewer um, older individuals. Mm -hmm. It it was just kind of like uh, something that what piqued my attention um, yeah. at the time, and then I hadn't really thought of it since. Um, and then I saw this paper, and the very beginning um, points out that regions with a high pro- prevalence of helminth infections reported lower morbidity and mortality um, with COVID-19. Right. And I had similarly heard this percolating in, you know, in scientific conversations in the news, but it was challenging because you know, places where there are high helmet infections may not have hospital systems or surveillance or be able to quickly do the types of studies that one would need to understand. Is it helmet infections? You know, there is, they may be taking anti-helmet medication, which does that play a role? So, and they even say in the introduction still in 2023, you know, almost September, there's one paper um, where, where it's a cohort study, and I forget the country, Brian, maybe you can... Uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia, demonstrating that what you said is correct, uh, that there are lower mortality rates um, compared to other regions. Uh, and, and But then maybe some anecdotal and reports and, and different and, and different things like that. But um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's been kind of percolating and, and we just don't fully understand. Right. You know, and there are lots of reasons. I, I will admit that when I thought about the articles I had read, um, I was like, oh, yeah, I guess those would be places with high prevalence of helminth infections. I hadn't made the connection myself at all until I read the beginning of this paper. Um, and that seemed interesting. Um, and then, yeah. of course, as I read the paper and thought about how it worked, it got even more interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is interesting how it works. And it's it's important to point out that uh, often uh, having the helminth infections or being from those parts of the world actually makes you more susceptible to a lot of different diseases. But it does seem to protect from very certain uh, specific things. Mm-hmm. We often mm-hmm. talk about like allergic diseases, for example, which is also interesting. But then this is a, a lung infection specifically. Right. Yeah. And and there are multiple things to think about, which this paper will touch on. What is the type, what type of helminth is it? Yep. Where is it infecting you? Yep. What is the timeline? Are you recovering? Is it a co-infection? Um, do you have other morbidities? So all these things. Yeah. So I found all of those things to be a, a reason why I wanted to talk about this paper. Plus, yeah. again, it really made me think about that Kiki Fairfax conversation. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, what did she say? I, I fell in love with worms or something like that? Something Wasn't like that, that. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so here, um, instead of trying to do this with an epidemiological uh, study, they set up a mouse model of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, they're using um, mice that are uh, transgenic for human ACE2, um, the K18 uh, HACE2 uh, transgenic mice, which we've mentioned a little bit on TWIV. Um, it's it's a mouse that is um, able to be infected with SARS-CoV-2, um, though there are some p- places where it's not a totally perfect physiological mo- model. It's a it's a nice model. Yeah, you you might have uh, the audience, or maybe they haven't, but might have heard it's it's the reasons it's not ideal or, or may not be ideal is the pathology in the brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. really seems to have high titers in the brain and pathology, which, I mean, I know we have, there have been identifiable symptoms of COVID, of SARS-CoV-2 in the brain, but it's not as severe as this mouse model. And they die, I mean, they, they succumb yes. pretty quickly. Yep. Yeah. And it's important to note that the transgenic mouse, for those aren't, that don't know a ton about these kinds of mice, is all of the cells in the body will be expressing the ACE2 receptor because it's under a constitutive promoter and it's genetically engineered into the mice, which is different from our normal situation where there are certain cell types that express the receptor and others that don't. So there's different um, spectrum of cells that get infected with the virus in the mouse model versus um, the natural infection. But in the, in the world of developing models, it is, you need to have a phenotype, you need to have clinical outcomes so that when you do your treatment X, or in this case, the helminth infection, you 
can tell if those differences are real. And then you would extrapolate that and apply it to other more human situations that are more translatable. But yeah, yeah absolutely. And they uh, used mice that had been infected with um, this helminth, um, uh, Nipostrongylus brasiliensis, mm-hmm. um, which is um, a nematode roundworm that infects rodents. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is a multicellular uh, but still microscopic worm um, that can lead to infection of these rodents. Um, and it, in a lot of ways, is similar to the human hookworm um, pathogen. Um, so um, they are looking at a, this infection. And this specifically is a helminth that um, has different phases in different anatomic locations, mm-hmm. including a phase in the lung, um, which is really key here. It, some other experiments, they'll use um, a helminth that does not infect in the lung. And so one mm-hmm. of the the key parts of this is that the N. brasiliensis that they're using um, is a helminth that involves lung infection. Right. It's so funny when you work with viruses for a long time and you get used to their life cycle and then you read about parasitic life cycles and you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on here. I know. There's, there's, phases, there's way there's larvae- too complicated. <laughs> It's really fascinating, though, how you can co-evolve with this, you know, this parasite that has such a complicated life cycle. It doesn't just go in yes. and go out. It goes in, goes to a different tissue, then transmits to an intermediate host. It's, it's, right. it's absolutely yeah. fascinating. And there's evolution happening on both sides. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's crazy. <laughs> Um, so they took some mi- the mice, the transgenic mice, and infected them with the um, parasite and um, then waited 28 days to um, sort of allow recovery um, from this parasite infection. And it's important that these mice clear the, that infection. Yes. Right? So they, they, they get the infection and then they develop an immune response and they clear that infection. Right. So that when, when you're doing anything with these mice – Later, when they infect with SARS-CoV-2, as we're going to hear, though there's no parasites around anymore. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the clearance happens by like 14 days. Right. Um, so there have been about two weeks since there's been any parasite uh, in these mice. Um, so after that 28 days, um, the mice were infected with SARS-CoV-2 um, with a dose that is a lethal dose in these mice. Um, and their survival was monitored as well as weight change um, to see if they had weight loss as a a measure of them getting sick since they can't tell you that they don't feel well. They kind of huddle up in the corner and they shiver. They do. They do. You get an idea if you're observant. Absolutely. (laughs) But they don't say, hey, Um, I don't feel well. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And they saw that the um, mice that had previously been infected with N. brasiliensis um, did not lose as much weight. Um, they recovered their weight loss uh, a bit quicker, and they had a survival advantage. So um, 60% of the parasite-infected mice survived, while only 20% of the mice that hadn't been infected with the parasite uh, survived. And so that in and of itself is sort of interesting to realize that, okay, there's a mm-hmm. there's a, definitely a difference here in survival, something about having in the past been infected with this organism Mm -hmm. um, is protective. They um, did an experiment that's in the supplementals where they used a parasite that infects a different part of the body. So they used a parasite that infects the intestine um, and that did not give them protection. So it seems to be lung specific. So cool. Yeah. Which I think is really important. And that's one reason I, I thought this would be an interesting paper would be to think about, hear about what Steph thought about other mucosal sites and, (laughs) For sure. I mean, just right. The even though they talk to each other and they communicate through cells that are trafficking to each of them, they have their own um, evolved response. And and l- exactly. So what we'll go through is it's, it's very cool how it has adapted specifically to deal with in- infections of the lung. Yeah, yeah. love it. Um, they went ahead and looked at um, virus and saw that the. Um, parasite infected mice were uh, actually having a lower viral load. So it seemed as though they were clearing virus better. So, and that viral load was not different, although you can kind of see it start 
to a trend, bit. but yeah, by day three, but by day seven, it's pretty significant. lower viral load, lower infectious virus. Yeah. So uh, definitely the fact that it's a day seven thing indicates that it's clearance. Um, they yeah, actually look right. in a, a few things to see whether viral entry has changed. And that's not what's changed. It's really about that virus getting cleared by day mm-hmm. seven. Mm-hmm. And they did infectious virus, which is nice. To, it's just shame uh, Vincent isn't here. He would be yeah. happy about that, right? Because <laughs> most people not, are yes. just looking at viral uh, gen- genomic you know, particles or whatever and saying that that correlates with infectious virus, but they actually tested the TCID50s. Now, their experiments definitely lead them down the road to more of an adaptive immune response, mm-hmm. which we'll talk about. Um, but would you all have liked to see some innate uh, measurements just to s- see if there were differences in um, those first three days, cytokines? Um, I'm, sure tech- there no, are. I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. Uh, it depends. I, I think a lot of what they're going to try and come and argue is that there's uh, epigenetic changes right. that allow those mice to respond faster, to recruit the cells faster to the lung, to develop the adaptive immune response faster. So all of that likely leads back to the innate response. And then they, it, we'll get to it. They did do some tests on whether the yeah. innate cells were important or not for this whole thing. Right. I was yeah. going to say the cell subsets specifically, they do, they are important, but I guess I was more thinking from, from your all's perspective about, you know, interferon signaling. And yeah. I, I guess by 28 large. days it would calm down. Right. So sure. I, I don't, you, I, I wouldn't anticipate that there would be a whole lot going on at 28 days if the infection is cleared and you've repaired the tissue mostly, but right. that the cells are primed in a different way to respond right. uh, on yeah. on some other exposure. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they they look at you know amount of virus in the lungs. Um, they look at which cells are infected, and they also look at the brain. Um, as Steph mentioned, one mm-hmm. caveat to this model is brain infection, and they didn't see the particular differences in brain infection. Um, and so they thought that there seemed to be some difference in how well these mice could clear virus um, if they had previously been infected with M. Um, which in and of itself, to me, is a really fascinating observation. And yeah. I think that that already is really cool. I know. And I I actually thought it's not so easy, I, I unless I'm, I'm not that informed, but I don't think it's that easy to be able to find the transcripts of the microbe that you're looking for. In some single cell RNA sequencing. So they did do some single cell RNA sequencing and they could identify the transcripts of NEPO in the cells that were infected. And I think that that's really cool because I think it's very hard to do, especially with viruses, right? I'm not sure about parasites. Yeah, I I don't really know about with parasites. I mean, they definitely are looking at SARS-CoV-2 infection to see which cells were infected. Yes. Um, Quite a bit. And I... I think that was one place where throughout this paper, there are a few places where I was like, oh, this is an interesting idea. Or this is an interesting question I have, but the fields might know this. It's just that I don't. <laughs> oh, in terms of, right. Just like subspecific yeah. field knowledge. Yeah. yeah. I, I have to say that my knowledge of some aspects of immune responses to parasites is lacking. It's hard, you know, it's hard to know it all. It's, it's just too much. Maybe to no know. parasitology is its own world. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you're right. I mean, they were able to distinguish by single cell sequencing and then doing these gene enrichment score to incorporate the viral transcripts and find out what was infected. And you you definitely can see differences in, in the types of cells and just lower amounts of relative gene expression if they were in, previously infected with the parasite. Yeah. Yeah. So that was cool. Um, And then things started to get wild, cooler and unexpected. (laughs) Yeah, Um, because the big question is, why is this? So why are those animals that were infected with a parasite that's unrelated to SARS-CoV-2 able to clear the virus faster and survive the infection? Yeah, exactly. Compared to those that were not infected with the parasite. Sure. And you could try to, if I had just seen figure one, Mm -hmm. I might have tried to hand wave all sorts of different types of immunological explanations. And one explanation I don't think I ever would have 
come up with is a change in CD8 T cells. Mm -hmm. um, so they ended up looking at the lungs and they found that there were a lot of um, lymphocytes coming into the lung or a lot of leukocytes actually coming into the lung. Um, and when they actually tried to look specifically, they saw that in the parasite um, infected or previously parasite infected animals, there were more CD8 T cells um, in the lung at day seven following SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that makes sense in a CD8 T cells controlling a virus mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I, again, I don't know enough about immunoparasitology to um, think a ton about, C I, I would never have thought about a CD8 T cell and a parasite infection. <laughs> And it's specific for SARS-CoV-2, not the parasite. Right, exactly. Right. So, yeah. so what we're saying is that having a parasitic infection, having previously recently had a parasitic infection, it allows those antigen-specific CD8 T cells against SARS-CoV-2 to develop faster and to reach the lung faster. Yeah. So they right. look specifically at where in the lung those T cells are, mm -hmm. um, and they're actually in the parenchyma of the lung and not just happening to be in the blood. Um, that's in the lung. And they, as Cindy said, they look to see whether those CD8 T cells are specific to SARS-CoV-2. And they see that they are SARS-CoV-2 specific cells. And again, that would never have been um, a thing that I would have predicted. Um, it's, it's interesting too, because they do talk about, right, the effector memory subset, but then they talk about this subset called virtual, virtual memory. memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are you all familiar with these, vir <laughs> these this new subs? Well, I mean, I don't remember the year they were uh, coined, but virtual memory cells that seemingly aren't specific to um, a particular antigen, but have a memory like phenotype where they are more responsive. They maybe not be the full bang for your buck effector memory, but it seems to be along the lines of this trained immunity, epigenetic changes in the CD8 T cells, where if they're around, they are more responsive than a, a naive T cell um, to against the pathogen. So that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because I'm less familiar with those cells as well. And um, so getting to sort of see the importance of those cells. I, yeah, I can't remember. I I think it Ross Kettle's group at Colorado discovered them. Um, but I, 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 I don't know the backstory, but like why they were named virtual memory. Is it kind of like Because saying, they're naive T cells that express memory markers. Right. But I, just so they said, oh, they're virtually like memory. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're not <laughs> Asian experienced. They, amen. But yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So now they've seen these CD8 T cells kind of being enriched in the lung, and they want to see if those CD8 T cells actually are involved in this protection or involved in this better response. And they use antibodies to deplete CD8 T cells. So first they do the parasite infection. They let the mice um, recover from the parasite infection, and then they use antibodies to get rid of the CD8 T cells from those mice. So when the uh, mice are infected with SARS-CoV-2, there are no CD8 T cells in the mouse to respond and to be recruited to the lung. And when the CD8 T cells are missing, they don't have the same level of clearance. <laughs> Um, and they, so that tells us that this clearance, mm -hmm. um, that is happening as a result of previous N. brasiliensis infection, um, is happening through these CD8 T cells. Right. Yeah. And, and again, it's sort of like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. And, and when I thought about the role of the T cells and an increase in the number of T cells and things, it would not have surprised me to see and uh, NEPO specific T cells coming into the mm -hmm. lung with SARS-CoV-2 infection, right? Sure. Because if you've had a previous infection in one site and now you have another infection in the site, the same site, mm -hmm. it would make sense for cells to be rapidly recruited in case they might be seeing the same thing again, right? Mm -hmm. um, but these are actually SARS-CoV-2 specific. Mm -hmm. so, it, it, so it's interesting. So it's making new T cells. And definitely if you deplete those T cells, I, I mean, that was kind of a given experiment, right? Yeah. Because if you know you need CD8 T cells to survive the SARS-CoV-2 infection, regardless of the NEPO pre-infection, 
depleting them would have had an effect. No, that's, so that's I was, true. I was a little surprised by that experiment. And I, I, I kept thinking about it. I'm like, did I miss something? Was there another reason? But I think it was just that the CD8 T cells are critical. Yeah, I think yeah. it's just showing that they actually are playing a role. But my guess is maybe that was a reviewer request of like, hey, just Could be. deplete them. Could be. <laughs> Show us. Perhaps. Prove it. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> um, and just like a, a, a random editor's uh, comment, <laughs> on the bottom of page three, when they say with viral guard RNA, viral guide RNA, gRNA, they mean genomic RNA, right? Because viral gui- guide RNA is like a yes. CRISPR. Yeah, okay. there there is another place where I don't want to be, um, you know, super pedantic, but there is a <laughs> comma that is so in the wrong place that it changes the meaning of the sentence, and it very much makes me upset. <laughs> well, again, they, you're right. Like this is all minor. It's a yeah. great paper, but they, there are just certain things that you pick up, and you're like, it just it makes you think yeah that. yeah. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Um, So now they come to this question of, okay, so how is N. brasiliensis infection actually impacting SARS-CoV-2 CD8 T cells? Whether it's their generation, their recruitment. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, because I was going to say, because that that, this figure we just talked about only looked at three in seven days after the NEPO infection, right? So mm-hmm. it's not the the first, it's important. The timing's important. We talked about timing at the beginning. Yeah. The first figure, it was an infection with NEPO, strongulus, and then wait 28 days so they clear and then infect. The second figure, they're really looking at the early response, mm-hmm. an initial adaptive response to the NEPO alone. So it's just at three and seven days. But the question is, is now what you were saying, Brianne, is what happens if we leave a 28-day window like, and then infect with SARS-CoV-2? Right. Well, and they're, but they're also kind of wondering, like, what happened during those 28 days? Yeah. <laughs> um, that gave this ability to have an um, a improved response or different response. <laughs> right. Um, So they took lung cells um, at day 28 from the um, Ambrosiliensis infected mice. Um, So they hadn't done the SARS-CoV-2 challenge. They just waited 28 days. And they took cells from the lung and did um, single cell RNA-seq to find out that they had a lot of, um, you know, some different types of CD4 T cells, but particularly some alternatively activated macrophages. There's my comma sentence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I do remember reading that. It was alternatively yeah. comma activated. Yeah. So and comma alternatively that? comma oh, right. activated macrophages. Right, right. Could change it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So they basically found that the macrophages that were in the lungs were different um, were changed by having previously been infected with N. brasiliensis, and that these macrophages were now making more type 2 cytokines of that type 2 immune response that we talked about on the previous episode. Um, so there was, were uh, higher levels of interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-13. Um, they were found in different, uh, some of them were found in different cell types, um, but it seemed like there was sort of a different uh, immunologist term milieu uh, with the macrophages and how the macrophages were activated in the lung, just kind of at rest in these mice Mm -hmm. 28 days after they had infection. So, you know, after they'd recovered, as uh, was mentioned before. Right. Yeah. Macrophages, they're all, I mean, they're always up to something. They have many (laughs) subtypes that, you know, they're very confusing to me as somebody who doesn't study them. They're wild. Um, and those macrophages led to a different type of uh, CD4 T cells, specifically a TH2 uh, mm-hmm. type of cell. And so basically, like I said, the the whole milieu, the whole um, – there's another word that I want that I can't – environment, I guess, um, <laughs> of the lung immunologically is shifted. Right. Um, and, and this type 2 shifting is really based on how immunologists, I think, originally described – different cytokines that are secreted and right. and there's nuance in this type one and type two, of course, but the classic ones, interleukin four, interleukin five, interleukin 13, uh, really seem to be dominant 
in the macrophages, but also broadly when they do um, the transcriptional analysis. So it's it's definitely paint a, painting a picture that the lung is uh, TH2 biased in this way, which has implications for um, for their responses. Yeah. And so now you see the lung has a different environment. So you could imagine that, you know, that is recruiting or supporting different cell types, though they're not showing that specifically in this figure. Right. And you're talking figure three. Is yeah. That where we're, yeah. Yeah. And then like for CD4s, why that matters to them is now we can see more of these TH2, uh, which is mm-hmm. uh, their transcription factors, GATA3 or regulatory right. T cells, which is FOXP3, uh, their transcription factors. So you're you're seeing, as we know, CD4s, they're going to differentiate into all these different cell types. You're seeing that play out here. Um, I really liked the next part of this, although it also, I also had a bunch of questions um, because they also did, they did the same experiments, but they tried to look further out. So mm-hmm. they went out to day 45 right. um, instead of day 28. Um, and um, I think that's super cool, though. Part of me wants to know, like, how long does it last? What if you go longer than day 45? Yeah. How long can you go? <laughs> Is it forever? <laughs> <laughs> and and before, actually, uh, I don't know if we'll go back and touch on it, but just thinking about um, these different macrophage populations and what they express, and just because I, you know, I don't have much to comment on it, but you all may, but this alternative activation by arginase 1, so the gene ARG1 seems to be very dominant, and mm-hmm. and mannose receptor and a couple of different so it seems like so these macrophages in the context of changing are they going to stick with that phenotype are they I mean is that the phenotype that they are going to terminally differentiate into or no they can go back I I don't <laughs> 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 macrophages are really really plastic one way ba- right. and back the other way so I think even if so there's a whole bunch of things here um, I think even if they're you know M M two like Mm-hmm. If you hit them with a strong type one stimulus, they're going to produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. Okay. Um, whether it's exactly to the same extent as an unpolarized cell, I don't. I, I'm not sure, but um, they will make pro-inflammatory cytokines. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is ARG1 is used as a marker for M2, but we need to think of macrophages on a spectrum. Right. Right. So the, the, the like M, yeah, the the, the with T too. cells, it's a, a little clearer because there's a driving transcription factor that drives a sp- specific set of cytokines. And you can really, even in vivo and in single cell data, you can see this. Right. If you look at macrophages, and, and we're doing this with a collaborator, even in single cell data, you have many different types of macrophages that come out of any different stimulus. Sure. And sometimes there's different ratios, but generally it will, when you stimulate macrophages, they will whoosh into a bunch of different types. So even if you have an M2 type that makes arginase, it's probably also making INOS, which they, the data show that too. And even if you make an M1, which the predominant you know, marker for that is INOS or nitric oxide synthase. They'll also make arginase. So I have I have collaborators that will call me. Though we tried to make M1 macrophages and they have arginase, really high levels. I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, they kind of up, sure. upregulate both. So okay. this idea of this extreme M1 M2 really people are moving away from that sure. because it really is kind of. Uh, a mush mesh of, of different phenotypes that you can get from macrophages. So they really can go back and forth. Um, and they, and, and one cell, uh, one population of cells can differentiate into different subtypes, even with the same stimulus. So yeah, here's my question on that, Cindy, how much of that do you think is similar to what we might've said about T cells when we only knew about TH1 and TH2? Mm. You know, may, are there, is it because we're trying to divide what are really six different types or some other mm-hmm. different number of types into two? I'm not sure. Uh, some of the more recent studies in single cell analysis of macrophage have shown, like, you can you can cut them into inflammatory and non-inflammatory. And then you can cut them into glycolytic and non-glycolytic. There, there's, like, very various different subsets that you can make. So I don't, I mean, part of it is we probably haven't fully described all the different types, 
But a, a foam cell, for example, in an atherosclerotic plaque that's taking up lipids really has a completely different phenotypic and, uh, you know, transcriptomic difference from a, t a macrophage that you stimulate with LPS and it's pro inflammatory. So I, I think there, there are differences. I also think that single cell data allows us to see more than we could see before. And it's just a matter of where you set that threshold. Like if you set the threshold really low, you can divide them into like two categories. If mm. you or, or set the threshold high, you can divide them into two categories. If you set, the lower you set the threshold, you might get 20 categories of macrophages. And that's not taking into account, remember, we have different origins of macrophages too. So some are developed in during development and they see tissues very early during development. And they're they're from a different ontology. And one would argue, are they really even hematopoietic cells? Because they're coming from fetal liver, right? They're not from the bone marrow. And then after birth, there's bone marrow-derived cells that then see tissues and they're you know, monocyte derived macrophages in the tissues and they function differently and have different um, abilities to proliferate and things. So we have, it's very, it gets very confusing because you not only have different ontologies of macrophages that can have different functions, then you can divide them once you stimulate them into these different functional profiles as well. Fascinating. Yeah. And speaking of, you know, the why question, well, likely it's, it's very beneficial for the host probably to have these macrophages be so plastic. Um, yeah, well, you want them to be able to respond when they see a stimulus like a inflammatory, you know, a pathogen or whatever, but then they also need to be able to clean up the tissues. Yeah. Right. right. Because they, one of their main functions is to clear out all of the dead and dying cells and return to homeostasis as close as you can get to where you originally were. So they have a lot, a, a significant role in, in the fibrotic component, which is probably, they didn't really even talk about that yeah, in this paper, don't. but that's mm. probably a big component of that because when you have a lot of tissue damage in the lung, especially the macrophages need to repair that damage. And a lot of that is laying down new matrix, which changes the physical properties and the biological properties of tissue as well. Could that be part of why this is sort of uh, seeming to be a lung story mm -hmm. um, and not something that's going on in some of the other mucosal sites. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are specific changes that are going to happen to those macrophages in the lung that aren't going to happen to macrophages in the gut when you have a lung infection and vice versa. If you have a gut infection, it's not going to happen in the lung. This remodeling is tissue specific for where the infection occurred. Right tissue specific generally. I'm sure there's, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm sure somebody can correct me on that. There's probably, cause there's things that, that happen in your gut that change your brain and all of that. So yeah. with it, yeah. everything's connected together, but generally okay. if you damage the lung, you need to repair the lung and that's not going to affect the macrophages in the gut generally yeah. in quotes. Yeah. Yeah. So they do all, they, they, they show similar changes at day 45 that they mm -hmm. saw at day 28. And I, I would really love to know how long Mm -hmm. They last, and maybe th others know that in the field in a way that I do not. Well, it is funny when you, we review papers. You know, this is somebody's like oh, how X number of years of yeah. their work, oh, yeah. their life, and and we're those like, why didn't you look at innate markers? Oh, just take it out till you know day hundred. So it, it, it's you know easy suggestions when you're on this side of the of the. Aisle. Yeah, absolutely, and especially given that we talked about that CD eight longevity paper uh -huh. um, where, you know, the, the cells were still right. kicking at 10 years. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure I want, you know, at some point they're going to just say like, they're there for a really long time yeah, and they yeah. can't keep waiting. <laughs> <laughs> they need to get a PhD or get, get on with their project. Biologically <laughs> though, you need to think about this because um, we were talking about different parts of the world where they may have more worms. They're probably reinfected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because the those worms are in the environment, right? right? So it isn't a one and done. So it's not like biologically you're going to look at an infection that's cleared and then two years later you get SARS-CoV-2, right? right. I, I don't know the data for it, but I would assume since it's in the environment that these individuals are probably repeatedly infected, which is going to be different, I would think the second time or third time or 10th time because you should have specific immunity on board for NEPO as well. So the defense mechanisms and the damage that are done are going to be different than the first infection. 
Yeah. And, and these timing questions become really important because they're looking at day 28 after clearance. And so just like I've been wondering a lot about how long does it last, mm-hmm. um, you can also say, well, it, how early does this start? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, how much could a co-infection lead to something similar? Does it have to be cleared? How yeah. long cleared? Yes. And, and these animal models are zero negative. They've never seen this, this parasite before. And so that's another complexity. Or probably most parasites, right? Because we have yeah. very clean colonies. Right. Right. Should be the case. <laughs> Depending. Yes. What, one hopes that uh, that the NIH mice have not been right. <laughs> exposed to other parasites. Well, they they have certain you know yeah <laughs> ones that they allow in the facility, depending on how clean your facility yeah. is. But mm. yeah, yeah. So now they actually bring back SARS-CoV-2. So first, they had just been looking at what was happening with the immune cells in the lungs twenty eight days after um, and Brasiliensis infection um, to see how that lung environment had changed. And now they actually will start to look at um, SARS-CoV-2 infection seven days later, what are changes in the cells in the lung. Um, And so now can we see differences in which cells are responding to SARS-CoV-2 at day seven post-infection if the mice had their previous parasite infection or not? Um, And they find that, in fact, they do see differences, uh, as you might have figured out by this point. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. uh, Particularly differences in um, macrophage types, um, differences in arginase and in inos, um, as well as the differences that you might have expected in um, some of the T cell subsets and um, also differences in CD8 T cells. And so they, you know, have the idea that What's happening here is that perhaps the changes in the macrophages that are happening in that post-parasite environment um, are changing which T cells either can be recruited or are supported in the lung or are developing in the lung or polarized there. Um, And thus tying together those CD8 T cells that are responding to a whole different pathogen Mm -hmm. um, with um, the previous infection. I will say that look so they have a figure where they look at their attack se- their single cell attack seek data and the proportion of cells that have differences and dendritic cells are a major component of that and when you think about what cells are important to drive a faster CD8 T cell response and a, a faster CD4 T cell response and a more robust response Dendritic cells are pretty important. Like macrophages can present antigen, but the dendritic cells are the ones that are going to activate the naive uh, CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells. So I was a little surprised that they didn't look more deeply at the dendritic cell subsets, especially the cross-presenting dendritic cell subsets to look at CD8 T cell activation. Yeah, I think that I felt like it was very unclear to me how much of this was activation and how much of this was trafficking. Right. So they didn't look in the lymph node to see how right. quickly the CD8 T cells or CD4 T cells were activated in an antigen specific way. They just mm-hmm. looked at the recruitment to the the lung. And you're right. There's two components to that. The first is how quickly are they activated? And the second is how quickly are they recruited? And certainly the recruitment part is important because they did dive more deeply into that. And the macrophages are playing a key role in that because they secrete the, the chemokines that recruit the T cells. Yeah. And so I think that, that that's the one piece of that I'm less sure about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the dendritic cells potentially might be more important in the activating piece. Mm-hmm compared to the recruiting piece. And so how do we tease out the difference between those pieces and what's the most important part? Right. Hmm. Uh, So then they came up with another cool experiment. Um, And they reasoned that if changes in the environment, specifically changes in the type of macrophages, Um, based on what kind of activation those macrophages had 
previously seen, what kind of polarization to M1 or M2, as Cindy had mentioned, these macrophages had undergone. Um, if we got rid of those macrophages, then then did that change um, the CD8 T cells coming into the lung to protect against SARS-CoV-2? They used a um, drug, uh, clodronate, um, to uh, deplete macrophages, um, either by um, injecting it into basically two different uh, locations <laughs> um, to, to deplete different macrophages, whether they were trying to deplete the macrophages um, in the alveolar space or uh, interstitial macrophages. Um, and then they, uh, so they basically did the parasite infection, then they got rid of macrophages with their macrophage depletion, and then they did the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So um, they were trying to see if those, you know, having the macrophages in place was what was important. And um, they found that the CD8 T cells, um, particularly um, the CD8 T cells in the interstitial space, um, were key Mac macrophages. Or sorry, the macro. I'm sorry. Yeah, macrophages <laughs> in the interstitial space were really key in allowing for the CD8 T cell response. And so this, there were they didn't see the CD8 T cells um, present. Wait, did I say? I might have said that very wrong. Uh, <laughs> if they saying, deplete, they, they the, needed alveolar. Uh, yes. Yeah, they, they needed they alveolar. Deplete the alveolar. Uh, macrophages by injecting the clodronate liposomes intranasally. Intrasally, yeah. Right. Then they don't see that boost in T cell recruitment. Right. So, so you it need... seems to be those alveolar macrophages yes. that are producing chemokines or whatever that are then recruiting the uh, right. CD8 T cells to the yeah. tissue. Yeah. So you don't need the interstitial. You do need the alveolar. <laughs> Yeah, right. and just for the audience to picture, like the alveolar space is kind of the internal. It's where the airways, uh, the airways, right? Yeah, and then interstitial is right outside that before you get to you know a blood vessel that's kind of wrapped around it. Yeah, and it's a really cool technique. So those of you who are not familiar with this, yeah. so clodronate is a toxic drug, and they put it in these liposomes. And macrophages love to eat things, and so they eat these liposomes, and very few other cells eat these liposomes. Because of that, you can specifically deliver the drug to the macrophages and kill the macrophages, and they're eliminated pretty quickly. So it, and then the, uh, to layer on that, they they deliver it by different mechanisms. So you can you can inject clodronate liposomes to a particular tissue. If you spray it in the nose of the mouse, the 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 macrophages that are present in the airways of the lung will eat it, and those are the only ones that will die and leave. And if you inject it IV, it gets out enough out of the blood vessels that the, all the macrophages in the lung tissue itself, because it's very mm -hmm. highly innervated, um, then will get eliminated. Um, and so you and can specifically target one or the other, depending on the, the route of entry, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And you don't, I mean, and they say too, you don't get a hundred percent depletion. This Never. Isn't, I mean, yeah. No. It's not ever perfect, get, right? I don't know, 70 to 80, which is still pretty good. And then that's enough that you can see differences. I imagine it's, you would have to know your macrophage subset, which as we discussed is immense if you, and then you're having to target all of them. So I think this is a, a nice way to just broadly see, okay, if we de deplete macrophages, 80%, 70%, do we see something? And that would give us an indication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, and it's, you know, they do. It's not yeah. as if you yeah. only have to figure out only one perfect type of macrophage and get a hundred percent of them gone. Right. Um, they see the effect um, even with those caveats and it clearly makes a difference in the CD8 T cells um, in, in the lung. Right. For um, that, the alveolar macrophages. Yes. Right. Um, right. Which, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's kind of wild because I, I believe, and I, I need to brush up on that aspect of my macrophage biology, that there are far more interstitial macrophages okay. in the lung tissue than there are macrophages sitting around in the air. Which airways. makes sense, yeah. So if that's the case, you only need to deplete a couple of the ones in the airways, and now you lose a T-cell recruitment, but you could deplete all the ones that are sitting around in the lung tissue, all in quotes, right, 80% of them, and that doesn't have the effect. Right. So, and so it's it just a small number of them speak to then what the helminth infection is doing locally. So this, this very 
specific response in alveolar macrophages. And I don't know enough about their life cycle, but are they, do they say this? Are they only hanging out there? You know, when they do, when they have this lung phase, um, I'm, I'm just thinking of the effect of the helminth and why it's more specific to the alveolar macrophages. Well, I think part of it is mm-hmm. just that some of the other helminths don't have a lung phase. Mm-hmm. While they may have phases through other anatomic locations, they don't right. hang out in the lung. But I mean, specifically, this helminth does go through the lung, but why it only affects the alveolar. I just wonder if it's something specific to the macrophages or was the helminth more localized there? And so this epigenetic changes that we're seeing are more specific to those or, yeah. Or or maybe changes to stromal cells or other cells in yeah, the lung sure, sure. That, that are influencing the alveolar max. Cells. Yeah. Yeah. And so they basically see the difference they sort of expected uh, or they, see they, you know, they lose those CD8 T cells if they don't have the um, alveolar max, um, they lose, um, they, they see some changes in uh, CD4 cells, they see changes in viral clearance. Um, and so it comes up to paint this picture that helminth infection influences the alveolar macrophages, um, the alveolar macrophage environment in the lung. Um, and that influences what happens later with a uh, infection with you know, some other kind of lung pathogen. Um, and again, not that I, I think this paper is really fascinating. I'm not trying to, you know, give the author more experiments. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just want to clarify when they looked yeah. at the viral genomic RNA and also the infectious viral particles, they didn't see a difference if they depleted the macrophages, one population right. or the other. So it suggests that while the alveolar macrophages are really important for that boosted CD8 recruitment, there's actually both types of macrophages are important for the antiviral protective right. response. Right. Sure, of course. So it's more complicated than just getting more CD8 T cells into the lung. Right. And do you think that might be because macrophages themselves can be infected in this model by the SARS-CoV-2 virus? That may very well be, yeah. Yeah, that was a question I had because in humans, I don't know if we know. I don't know if we know that. Brian, you, you maybe follow there, the literature more closely. I think they do. They uh, in humans, you can have um, macrophages mostly that are actually getting infected through um, after they've had antibodies yeah. on them. And so it's sort of an antibody dependent phagocytosis. But I mean, I know that happens in other coronavirus infections, but you're saying that happens for SARS-CoV-2 in humans. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. I thought that was the case. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be cool to see if this, you know, see another lung pathogen here. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, that's cool to see point. like influenza virus. Mm. And does this also change your influenza response? They so is it all about, lung pathogen? They talk about RSV. Mm-hmm. Um, that there, oh gosh, it was, um, a pr- they, there was not a protective response as, rep- well, oh, okay. That was like a, maybe a gut associated. Yeah. But that's a different, um, that's a different pathogen. Pathogen. Helmet, yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was a co-infection study. So you're right, right. That would be to do just the same exact thing with other. Yeah. Other so, it, you know, it, it gets the idea of how much of it is timing right. co-infection mm-hmm. versus recovery, how much of it is the anatomic location of the uh, parasite infection right. um, involved in whether you see protection or not. Mm-hmm. They do say, though, that um, people with asthma, which is a TH2 driven response, were not more susceptible. Yes. And I've seen that literature in kids and adults Mm -hmm. consistently that they are not more susceptible. I was surprised by that because my mom mom and my sister have asthma. And when when SARS-CoV-2 first came into play in COVID-19, I was really worried about them, right? Because Mm -hmm. they have vulnerable lungs to begin with, but it didn't seem to be uh, a significant risk factor. And that's interesting. Like, do you wonder if some of these similar mechanisms could be in play? That exactly, you have this, this TH2. TH2 bias and then the macrophages are bringing in more CD8 T cells. I don't know. There also is the confounding factor that because steroids are effective mm-hmm. against the disease COVID-19, so then if those yes. individuals are more likely to be taking steroids. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, see, now you're making me uh, curious about that influenza experiment even more because I don't think that 
it's the same with asthma and influenza. Right, 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 right. No. Okay. Influenza time. It's time to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I like this paper because A, it brought up, uh, it pulled in CD8 T cells and virus infection um, with a parasite, um, all of which were things I would not have necessarily ever put together. Um, I would not have thought of helminth infection having it necessarily an impact. Um, and sometimes we think about, you know, co-infections or we think about um, previous infection history, um, mo- you know, influencing, you know, cross-reactive if- responses or something like that. Mm-hmm. But we don't always think about things like those environmental changes to the macrophages. Um, it reminds us of trained immunity and the fact that that field is more important and even potentially thinking about what's happening with the structure, um, as Cindy mentioned, with uh, the fibrosis um, or the, the change in the structure of the lung. Um, and so past infection um, can do a lot to impact your pathology with current infections. Um, and um, those observations and my friend's email of, no, it was definitely real. Um <laughs> you know, may actually have something to it. And it may be teaching us something cool about immunology that we didn't really know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you brought up the concept of trained immunity and it really has to do with these patterns of chromatin accessibility. And they do mention it in the paper that their macrophages had transcriptional profiles that Mm -hmm. showed this pattern. And so if you have more chromatin accessible to be able to activate them, that that could play a role. The other thing, because I'm very, I love the trafficking aspect of these immune cells that you, you saw chemokines, CXCL16 was Mm -hmm. the one, I mean, Mm -hmm. they're all like CXCL and then the number. So, you know, it's, you just get to memorize them. Uh, but that they, that was upregulated. But if I remember not that it's cognate receptor correct at baseline, but later on it was upregulated. So you're really talking about upregulating these, these chemotactic markers and receptors that bring the cells in, Mm -hmm. which was different with helmet infections. Yeah. So it's just, it's very cool. Um, and you know, for, for implications, it, it makes us think about, well, timing, you're right. Cause you don't want to just assume that somebody who has a helmet infection is just, uh, you know, they don't need, uh, the pharmaceutical interventions right. like immunization, but it, it, does it lead to different public policy or does it lead to different mm. um, outcomes for different countries? Yeah. And, and, you know, there have been all of these ideas about changing TH1, TH2, type one, type two bias regarding the hygiene hypothesis, mm-hmm. um, how would that impact other infections? Um, I, I honestly, again, I go back to the Kiki Fairfax conversation mm-hmm. of, you know, what is this telling us about how we've evolved in response to these organisms and what's happening now that we're not being infected with them? Right, right. Not that I want at them. <laughs> I, I, when, I, when I actually um, looked at a picture of N. brasiliensis, before this, I kind of shuddered as soon as I looked at it. <laughs> you, if you see blown up images of some of these parasites, it's it's like a, a, a horror film. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. It's like, okay, well, maybe my macrophages will be TH2 biased, but I don't really want to have that infection. No, <laughs> no, no. But there, so there are a couple of things here. One is that people have looked at for um, IBD. So inflammatory okay. bowel disease, this is a similar idea to what's going on in the lung, where if you have a parasite infection, you seem to be protected. So there, there, are, there was an individual who, who took uh, a pig parasite <laughs> and mm-hmm. was treating himself and other people with IBD, <laughs> and it was working. It doesn't uh, cause an actual infection. It's cleared. So it's uh, the trichinella suis. Am I am I correct? I, I just know um, trichinella. I might have the wrong one, but it's suis. It's the pig one, um, and it's the one of the forms of the parasite. It's a particular form of the parasite that they they ingest, and it's supposed to help with their IBD. Interesting. Again, not suggesting that anyone goes out and gets parasites, especially nepo style, you know, these kind of worm yeah. parasites to to prevent infections. But it's it's an interesting idea of 
biasing or manipulating the microenvironment of the tissue that then changes the susceptibility to a different infection or yeah. disease. And and the more if we knew more about it, I mean, you noticed we've talked about you know immunoparasitology is like its own thing. We don't know X, Y, or Z. Perhaps if more people knew about it, we would know how to manipulate it better. I think it's papers like this that need to raise the awareness and stature of studies on uh, immunology and parasites because if it doesn't affect people in the U.S., the government agencies are not really funding that type of research. It's challenging to get strict parasite immunology research funded. Mm -hmm. I know of lots of people who have money for it, but it's often on understanding the immune response using the parasite as a model rather than studying the immunology to the parasite for the sake of understanding the immunology to the parasite. So, well, and I, I, it yeah. also, we also have to make sure that we have immunologists who want to study some of those things. We mentioned, oh, it's so complicated with all these life cycle stages. Um, and I think, you know, we've got to spur the interest um, with things like this as well, of people being like, okay, it's worth studying all those life cycle stages that are so crazy looking. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that's come out of kind of this type of idea where pre-infection with one thing changes your susceptibility to another thing is that we often, we have gone from using m mice as a model to cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and mm -hmm. cleaner mice to the mm -hmm. point of having notobiotic mice that don't have any microbes at all. And yep. recognizing that, well, wait a minute, their immune system is not fully developed and their immune response is not the same as right. we see in a human, for example. And even in specific pathogen-free mice, often the immune response is not the same as we see in a human. And people are like, well, mice aren't humans. And mice's environment is also very different from the human environment. So now people are starting to use dirty mice or patch up mice yes. where they harbor a lot of pre-existing infections, parasites, they've had virus infections, they have bacterial infections, they mm -hmm. share them with the colony and that changes their susceptibility to infection and their, their yeah. immunologic response is fascinating. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating. So today, um, today is my first day of classes for the oh, semester. Cool. Um, right. So right before this, I had actually taught my first immunology class for the semester. So uh, the past few days I've been spending a lot of time thinking about syllabi and exactly what to teach when. Um, and I spent a long time this weekend trying to decide exactly where the dirty mouse paper goes uh. because I spend a, I actually sp have a whole class on the dirty mouse model. Um, and That's some of the cool. papers about that for those exact reasons. So where did you decide to put it? Um, I put it right near, um, some of my other discussions of memory. Yeah. Uh -huh. cool. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, because if you, especially the the paper that I usually use has a lot of measurements of memory responses. Right. Very cool. The other thing I wanted to bring up that you know may be worth a couple points of conversation is they they brought up the fact that they didn't confirm whether the cytokines themselves were you know responsible for some of these phenomena that they're seeing. And it does bring up the point about these TH2 cytokines can really be detrimental in certain mm -hmm. diseases. And mm -hmm. in response to, uh, if you think about all vaccine outcomes, um, poor vaccine outcomes can use, can be tracked to in this overabundance of some TH2 cytokines. So it, it, it does uh, bring up the point of when those come into play and, and why. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and, what cells are they recruiting? So particularly we think about mast cells being detrimental because they're recruiting the, you know, an IgE induction. So it doesn't seem to be that the case here, and, and it might be because they've recovered. And so, and the timing of it, because we've already talked about that, but it's, it's just interesting when I have read a lot of it, and even in COVID-19 severity studies, they show that TH2 cytokines are upregulated. So trying to piece that together in your head of like, okay, when are they good? When are they bad? Trying to create a checklist for yourself is, is, is difficult. I, th I think it's like anything, like it's the dose and timing. Yeah. Right. Because I always say everything can kill you, even water, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So an overabundance at the wrong time, of course, yeah. 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 It's, it, all of immunology comes back to Goldilocks. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that we can stay alive. 
survive. I know. I think about that a lot. <laughs> and I just got my flu shot a little early this year. Yeah. So I wanted to Ooh. Um, transfer some placental antibodies uh, Good before, for you. you know, cold and flu season. But so, yeah, you know, thinking about it, it's it's funny when the things you study, then you go experience them in real time. It's just it's a good field to be in, but it's complicated. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know enough to know if there are other helminths that are specific to other anatomic locations mm-hmm. or that, and whether you could sort of try to do something similar with, say, a mucosal pathogen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, could you, about, right. Could you infect with their gut? So they have their gut. I don't remember the name of uh, the H. Polygyrus. Oh, these polygyrus. Yes. Okay. And yeah. so then could you do that? Wait 28 days and follow up with. I mean, rotavirus, you rotavirus, something. right. Or some mm-hmm. infectious agent, norovirus doesn't replicate in animals, but whatever you want to use, uh, or a non-infectious pathology like IBD or whatever X you want to do. I'm trying to rack my brain if I've, I don't remember off the top of my head if there has been something looking at parasite infection and IBD, but I bet there isn't. A listener can well, probably let me no, know. No, I think you mentioned there were there were. Uh, yeah, so there's this the the pig, trichuris. Yeah, yeah right. Was, that up, right. Uh, so that definitely has an effect. There must be. Yeah, you you wouldn't want one of these parasites though that does a massive amount of damage. Right. So trichuris normally does you would that. never it, want like, a parasite. It, it, it like swims its way through the epithelium, but the but the pig one doesn't infect the human as well. So I think that okay. that's how it works. Interesting. I'm probably talking too much because I think I probably said something wrong. I don't know. <laughs> that's okay. The headless people can email us. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, having a bad reaction to the thought of things swimming through. <laughs> through your well, it's not, it's not even swimming in your intestine. It literally no, is through, yeah, exactly. through your epithelial cells. <laughs> they just, Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at some of those hookworms, the mouth is like something from Dune. I know. <laughs> from Dune. Yeah, yes. Say. Or um, what was that other? Or movie? I should say, Dune's worm is probably based on oh, probably <laughs> airsight picture. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, thanks for this paper, Brian. I mean, I think it was great fodder for good conversation. Yeah. Do you guys want to learn to think- do emails? Sure. We got we got two based on our discussion last month, which is kind of okay. fun. It's about the cilantro stuff. Oh well, I'll let you two tackle that since I wasn't on last time, but I'm I'm excited. Oh, that's right. So so okay, so <laughs> before we go into it, are you a cilantro fan or not a cilantro fan? Not a cilantro fan. No. So there you no. go. We're two and two because I was the only one that didn't like it. But Brianne and Vincent were like, We love cilantro. Oh uh, yeah. So fun. So um, I don't know. Do you do you want to read it, Brian? I can read it. it. Sure, I do have it. Um, Lauren writes, "Hi guys. First off, thanks for an excellent and reliably engaging podcast. In your recent episode on allergy, Cindy mentioned an avoidance to cilantro and postulated that it might be related to a subclinical allergy." I recently found myself in a rabbit hole about how polarizing cilantro was, and your mention prompted me to share it. Can't promise all the details are correct. I have a pretty superficial understanding, but mainly sharing as a point of curiosity. The flavor of cilantro comes mainly from aldehyde moieties binding to olfactory receptors. One of these aldehydes, trans to decanal, decanal, binds to uh, OR6A2 olfactory receptor, and this receptor has genetic polymorphisms which correspond to an individual's like or dislike of cilantro. There was a population study from 2012 in the journal Flavor, excellent journal name, which put the dislike prevalence at around 10 to 15 percent. A couple other random factoids which might help explain a dislike of cilantro. One, aldehydes, including trans 2 decanel, are byproducts of saponification reactions, and a lot of people who dislike cilantro specifically report a soapy taste. Two, trans 2 decanel is the also the compound that gives stink bugs their characteristic pungent odor. I personally like cilantro and have since wondered if I should start substituting stink bugs into some salads for an additional no. protein boost. <laughs> no, don't do it. It's so no. funny. 
Three, if you don't like cilantro but want to make it more tolerable for some reason, you can try mashing or grinding it up to a pulp. This releases an aldehyde reductase enzyme naturally present in the leaf and might blunt the flavor. I would personally just elect to avoid cilantro in this instance. <laughs> That's all I've got. Hope it explains why Cindy might like dislike cilantro. Though I guess it's also possible that she does have an allergy and a subconscious avoidance after all. <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> Lauren. Good. You know, good. when I read that, I thought that was absolutely fascinating because I can tolerate it in salsa. Okay. okay. I don't love it. I don't love it, but I can tolerate right, but it's it. But tolerable. boy, if you put the fresh cilantro on top of something i have to pick every single little teeny tiny <laughs> bit out oh, no i can't eat it yeah so uh if it's mixed in with something it's okay like mm. i can eat it in guacamole if it already has it in there or in sal- in salsa but not I- how about you steph yeah i think this is it sounds similar that right like i don't think i'd uh, be bothered if it was in salsa, but you're right. It's the fresh. It's right on top. I'm just like, yeah. so it may have to do with Lauren's comment about it mashing it, it up right. and, and somehow that releasing some of the, the potency. Flavor. I definitely yeah. would not recommend <laughs> trying the, stink the, bugs for your salad. Thing. I, I, I mean, I don't know if there's a difference in, in tolerability of that either, but I certainly cannot tolerate it, <laughs> tolerate it at all. We ha- occasionally have them in the house. Now I, I'm not a huge bug squisher, but um, stink bugs particularly, I am very careful to go grab something and like pick them up and carry them outside and toss them because I is will it, not squish them in the house. You don't like the crunch oh, sound? Or, oh, no, or just, no. Oh, the smell. They're called stink the bugs okay. for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, bad. Yeah. It's really, really <laughs> bad. And it gets into everything. It'll get on your hands if you, even if you use something else to squish them. Yeah, they're, they're pretty bad. Yeah, no, they're bad. <laughs> I also really liked the uh, discussion of he. Uh, Lauren looked something up and mentioned that they went down a rabbit hole Uh um, because (laughs) this weekend there, I kept going down random rabbit holes instead of, you know, working on things I was supposed to do. (laughs) Yeah. I I got a whole bunch of, uh, I got some sort of weird bug bite or sting or something. And I also had just a bunch of mosquito bites and I spent so much time trying to think about like detailed immunology of why <laughs> what was going on with my bug bites and i was like you know i'm not sure that this is really the best use of my time maybe good for class down the road <laughs> maybe you know well yeah. so we had one other um uh email but it, it's on the same topic but it's it's funny uh matt writes hi immunisty immunisty I don't know. I thought it was a take on the Illuminati, but yeah, uh, but Illuminati maybe. Yeah. I guess okay. maybe Illumin. Yeah, I don't know. Ah, Immunisty. Immunisty. Aha. Uh-huh. I think I it was Cindy who said she didn't like the taste of cilantro. Yes, maybe you already know this, but there is a genetic variation that makes cilantro taste like soap. In- to some people, perhaps that's the cause. This would not surprise me because genetics are uh, our thing. So both my mom and my dad have dark jet black hair and darker skin. And in case you haven't noticed, I have red hair and very fair skin. So I got (laughs) the, you know, the very recessive genes and they both like cilantro, but they probably both carry the gene for not liking cilantro. So I think I just got the jackpot of all the recessive genes in in my family. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Do you guys have anything else? All right. So then that's 71. So questions and comments to immune uh, can be sent to immune at microbe TV. We'd love to hear your emails. Also consider supporting the science shows of microbe TV, including immune at microbe.tv front slash contribute microbe TV is a 501 C three. Stephanie is a, at Case Western Reserve University. And you can find her on uh, Twitter still a little bit, maybe, uh, at Stephanie so. Langle. I'm, I'm reevaluating my relationship with Twitter. Uh, right we're now. all reevaluating, uh, reevaluating yeah. our relationship with X. Hey, well, X. Yeah. 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 X. <laughs> I feel like that's something you call something and you don't want to talk about it. X. X. You might have yeah. read a thought. Read a thought about that. <laughs> so uh, Steph's at Stephanie Langle, and Brianne Barker is at Drew University, and she's at Bioprof Barker. Uh, and it's not just on X slash Twitter. I have made that my name on all the social medias. Oh, okay, great. You can find you anywhere. Yeah, I open. I even like made an account on Threads for a 
and made sure I had the same name. And then I don't think I've opened it since. <laughs> oh, well, at least you got the, the name. The so name. that's good. Right. Yeah. So I'm Cindy Leifer at Cindy Leifer. And Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. <laughs>